Bruce, I, uh, I had just gotten a Greyhound a few months earlier, so I was just getting used to waking up at O'Dark Stupid in the morning to go for the morning walk. And of course, like everyone who, who works in, in higher ed, I'm checking my email, it's the first thing crack of dawn, and I get this email saying, you know, we owned you, and check out our thing on Pastebin, and opened it up, and wow, that looks legitimate, and started the chain of phone calls from there. That was my first IT security incident, and I wasn't even part of IT yet. Um, I was still over in communications and marketing. Um, so I moved to ITS in July 2012 to help form the new security action team. So why a team approach? So how many people here are familiar with comic books in, in general? Um, okay, so DC and Marvel, I, I happen to be straddling the fence on that, I'm, uh, I guess multi-denominational. Um, but you've got these awesome superheroes. You've got Superman who can pretty much do anything. One little weakness. You've got Wonder Woman who's, you know, got an amazing strength and the ability to make people tell the truth, which um, my job would be really handy. Um, you've got the Green Lantern um, who sheer force of will can make things happen. And of course, you've got Batman who has no necessarily superpowers, but a, a ton of technology and just a, a drive to get stuff done. When it comes to IT, sometimes I relate the most with Batman. You know, I get the coolest tools and I've got sort of that detective mindset. And that's what I bring to the table. And I'm absolutely blessed to work with an amazing team at ITS at UNB where I can tap into not only the folks who are formally part of the security action team, but anybody with relevant expertise on any incident we deal with. And that means it's, it is a distributed model for um, responsibility, but it also it's a multi-talent model. So what is the security action team? We're a group of passionate IT professionals who bring different perspectives and expertise together in order to solve challenging problems. Because honestly, some of the stuff that we got to deal with, you got to look at it 15 different ways. And uh, it can be a lot of fun, but there's no one person I don't think, and okay, there might be a couple of really good IT security ninjas out there that can do it all. Um, but all of us can use some help and some support. So the founding team members, there's myself, and I've got this cool enterprise strategy analyst title. Basically meant I had an opportunity to help form and, and develop this new job and role that I'm in. My primary responsibilities are for user education, although I like to call it behavior change, um, and not just education and awareness. It's actually starting to change how people um, think about the situations they're in. Um, but I also do the inv incident investigation and coordination. Um, then Benjamin Steves, who's the manager of our solutions and applications development team. Um, ben is a long-standing IT veteran, knows our server infrastructure inside and out and development environment inside and out. And his team are amazing assets to me. Um, Charles Spencer, who was the manager of our network and data services. Um, unfortunately, that position um, was eliminated in, in the latest round of, of budget changes. But Charles was a, was a very important member of our team and, and helped us get off the ground. Um, the network and data services folks provide you know, critical understanding of our firewall, our infrastructure, um, the physical stuff that things get connected to. So what is our mandate? The Security Action Group provides IT security leadership to the university and is responsible for formulating, implementing, and coordinating IT security plans and projects across the enterprise. So I don't just work for the University of New Brunswick and Fredericton, I work across the university um, environment. Um, so we respond to IT security incidents and issues and enforces policies to ensure the university is protected at all times. So we're growing and getting better at this. Um, this is sort of what, we're, what our, our high level goal is. We advise UNB and IT security resourcing technologies and community education and we draft security policies as required. So how it works is we'll start drafting a policy. We have an amazing director of quality assurance. So she not only makes sure some of these a really good point about if you have policies, but you don't have the process to back it up, it's not worth a damn. Um, and she, that's absolutely right. Um, so she helps us with that. So what are our challenges? And, and I suspect these are fairly common across um, higher ed. So we have to balance the need to protect sensitive data and critical infrastructure with the university's mission in teaching, learning, and the dissemination of knowledge. Um, you know, we've got everything on our network from really cool research going on in history, sciences, computer science, et cetera, to the fact that we have our power plant, our heating plant, and environmental controls, you know, are all part of our IT environment. Um, we have, you know, incredibly uh, large amounts of sensitive data, um, both as part of the university's business and as part of its uh, research that we have to protect. 
So we also have this challenge of balancing and prioritizing resources against a constantly evolving threat environment. This is probably the thing that was the most challenging for me getting used to IT security universities is I first got in there the first month, I was like, oh my God, we're doomed. Right? Look at all these problems. What, how are we ever going to get through this? And I think I'm, I'm, I'm gradually growing into the role of understanding the, the spectrum of risk and prioritizing um, targets and, and what I want to actually achieve in a given year and recognizing that there's no way to solve it all overnight. Um, and even if you could theoretically solve it all overnight, the landscape will change the next day anyway. Um, so it's a balancing act. And this is one that uh, we're getting better at is balancing reactive work because a lot of my job is investigations and dealing with stuff and closing doors with actually proactive plans and projects that can save us a lot of pain down the road. So getting better at that. So. Like any good team of superheroes, we of course have our rogues gallery. So this is what I've encountered in 12 months. So script kitties, um, they're probably actually the largest part of our business. Um, you know, these aren't highly, in, highly trained, skilled, um, nation state backed hackers that are, these kids are just trying out everything they can. And this is where it goes to, uh, someone had asked me in an earlier session about the value of doing automated application scanning and those type of things. Honestly, if you can keep the script kitties out, you're cutting out a large part of your, your problem. We have uh, seen instances, and we do deal with um, organized international um, crime groups, and particularly around malware. Um, hacktivists, of course, we've had two run-ins with them so far, and I'm sure we'll have more. Um, nation state back, back advanced threats, yeah, we, we've seen some interesting things, particularly around intellectual property um, and, and gathering information around that stuff. And of course, some of our own users. Um, so you don't have a faculty of computer science. If you don't have a faculty of computer science on your campus, then you're probably a little bit safer. But you know, we, we actually teach folks how to do some pretty amazing stuff, and occasionally that can come back to bite us. Um, so what are the actual threats? Um, cyber stalking, cyber bullying. So we, we had a case, actually a couple of cases of this now, where um, it's part of our user education behavior change um, campaigns about sharing passwords. Now that's problematic when boyfriend X and girlfriend Y are no longer together and then all of a sudden boyfriend X is logging into the accounts and reading all kinds of stuff and sending out emails and then of course we get dragged into it because it's an account issue and the person's being stalked and oftentimes that's going to involve law enforcement. So you've had a couple of incidents with this type of stuff and it's not top of the, top of the issue in terms of the damage to the institution but to the actual individual user this is a huge issue. Um, so we take it very seriously. Cyberbullying, we're seeing more and more of this. Um, I don't know if your institutions have acceptable, how many people have acceptable use policies at their institutions? So, you know, one of the things about ours is we talk about using um, ICT ethically and responsibly um, in there. And of course, um, if someone's on our network, even though they might be using third party thing, we had, we had an incident with two residence um, roommates who decided to get into, well, one decided to get into a social media uh, taunting fest and uh, didn't actually end up getting escalated to me because the residence folks dealt with it but we have levers in our acceptable use policy to say okay you're using our resources our network lab computers etc there, there could be a, a penalty around that phishing identity theft oh man uh, this is probably like my entire month of May so um, in uh, in May, we had two successful phishing attacks and what's interesting is it, I used to think that phishing was a larger part of the problem uh, in terms of, of security. And, and actually, when something looked at, we got some like 20,000 um, e active email users. And uh, you know, the last six months, two responded to phishing attempts, which is like a 99% success rate. So you know, we're doing pretty good. But man, when they give those credentials up and you've got an exposed uh, SMTP server that's available on the internet, you can crank out a lot of spam. We had a, a rudimentary um, uh, blocking system that cut off accounts after 8,000. They had a slight flaw around the from address. Uh, these cats from India learned that, hey, if we just rotate the from address and they're all asleep at 2 a.m., um, we can have a good time for six hours. And so managed to put out a million um, spam out there, which made Sorbs very unhappy at us. And also, worse for that is all the stuff coming back is these guys don't really have good email lists, so you get a lot of bounce backs when this happens. It, uh, your incoming mail servers don't have a good week after that happens. Um, 
Denial of service. Okay, this was hilarious. I never thought I'd see this one coming. Um, so February, just after just after Valentine's Day, um, I get an alert on my phone that our network systems are starting to degrade. I'm like, what's going on with this? I just got out of the movie theater. I was in a good mood. My wife was with me. I got to go into work and check this out. She's like, really? Okay. So we go in, and, and for eight minutes, our, our whole network was just getting pounded. So I thought that was weird, and so after it happened, it went away. Nothing, nothing happened. I was able to track down that it came from a, it was attacking a single IP in our residence. So I contacted, we were able to find out who the user was, and it was actually associated with their Xbox console. And what had happened was they were playing a competitive game of Texas Hold'em. The person was losing, and so launched a DDoS against them from the states. I thought that was weird, but that was nothing compared to the second wave in which he was a competitive player, same same individual, on uh, Call of Duty. And uh, he likes to record a session, so we had the three people bragging. Number one, they said they were going to do what's called a swatting, which is where they call the local police department and say the person's about to do a bomb threat against your school, and they have the SWAT team show up at his residence. Um, they never actually did it. Um, the other thing was they either were able to spoof or successfully had, and I suspect they actually just bought a, a botnet. Um, and so we had 40,000 IPs pounding away against our one uh, residence IP, although it didn't actually choke down our two one gig pipes. It just knuckled our firewall pretty good. Um, so that was a lesson learned. Then we had a third incident that required uh, some more significant attention around denial of service. And this was something we never expected. We were anticipating denial of service around some sensitive research. We had just announced a uh, our computer science faculty had just announced that they had broken a major botnet back in the fall. You can imagine the panic in my eyes when I said, you're going to go public with what? Oh, awesome. That's, that's not going to make anybody unhappy with this. Um, but that never materialized. But p teenagers getting um, mad about video games? Oh, yeah. So malware. Um, and, and what I'm learning now more and more is uh, the, the delivery mechanism that we suffer the most from. If I could draw a heat map on our campus, it would be our residence would be our sort of heat map of malware. And it's all behavior driven, right? So they're going for their BitTorrents and all that fun stuff. They're getting JavaScript exploits um, compromised on their websites. Then that's disabling, if they even have any virus, what's on there. And then all the fun begins. We actually had an administrative professional who was in, just for December, you know, the quiet times, was downloading the Katy Perry movie um, on their machine um, and managed to get a uh, nice uh, Trojan on there at uh, stole a thousand bucks in their banking. Uh, it came up in our seam that this thing was doing weird things. So of course I went and knocked on the door. Um, I think the funniest thing is said, oh, that's why that money went missing from my bank account. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's probably a good connection between those two things. Um, but malware has been fun. Intellectual property theft, financial theft. So we've seen some weird stuff where um, people, again, downloading um, BitTorrents uh, end up with hidden FTP servers that are beaming stuff back to countries in Asia. Um, and, you know, that has unfortunate impacts, I think, if they had any patentable ideas. Um, so good times on that. And, uh, you know, again, uh, attempts at financial theft uh, to the same way. Spamming, again, at us and from us. Oh, and the, and the uh, theft, we also had an incident recently where someone tried to use Dell's purchasing system to order some laptops and have them shipped outside the university, which was uh, fun to deal with. And that's in the uh, theft and fraud side. So uh, some lessons learned for us. Every good uh, superhero team needs a watchtower. Um, so we actually are blessed. We have uh, access to uh, Curator, um, which is a huge um, tool. Not all institutions have a security intelligence monitoring solution, not have a log management solution, et cetera. But honestly, this is, this is the thing that enables me and terrifies me at the same time, um, in that um, I can look at this thing all day and find problems. Like, no problem. I'm bored and just put, load up Curator and let's go fix a problem to solve. See, so really the biggest challenge with this is prioritizing, okay, what, what is the areas that I need to focus on? What are the biggest threats? What are the most sensitive data uh, that we need to pay attention to? You can barely see it here, uh, um, but I actually was able to develop a screen on it um, from a search that actually shows me all the RDP remote SSH attempts against our Fredericton campus. In the last week of April, I managed to, we recorded 700,000 remote intrusion attempts in a seven-day period. Um, and when some folks leave the same username and password on their high-powered Linux server, somebody, someone said, that's not a compromised machine, that's a giveaway. Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, that, that can be fun. So we monitor that and deal with the, the issues as they come up. Um, and that gets into the focus and key. So there was a really interesting um, presentation earlier by Lawrence talking about the 
deprimitization of the network. And I'm, I'm kind of on the, the reprimitization side of the equation that, you know, this era where we're able to rely on one or two, our, our IPS, our IDP, our firewall, and okay, we're safe. I mean, it was never really real, but it made us feel better, I guess. Um, that era is over. You're still going to need those tools, but you're not going to be able to protect your entire computing environment. That's just not going to happen. I mean, you, you look at UNB, and we've got thousands of staff computers plus all the BYOD, BYOD devices, we're not going to be able to totally secure those and encrypt them. So we have different areas of concern. So that's our total environment. Next, you do have a managed environment. So in our case, this would be actually UNB owned assets, stuff that's an active directory, stuff that you can have group policies for, you do own. You can do more stuff within this area. And there's what, what I'm defining as the core, and, and, and I'll get more into depth on what the core is, but these are your most sensitive users' devices information and that you do need to spend the maximum amount of time focusing on. In terms of the entire environment relies mostly on automated and structural defenses. Um, so these are things like uh, network access control solutions, so who can get on the network wirelessly and wired. Um, one gig, one potential asset in that is posturing. So do they have updated antiviruses and updated operating system? Um, DMZ also comes into play with these automated and structural defenses, like what things, you know, all these BYOD devices, do they need to necessarily have direct access to your most sensitive systems? No. Um, you know, most cases actually, most people who bring their devices in, this is my own opinion, um, particularly students, they want access to the internet. You know, so we can enable that and still protect other things. Um, automated defense for the managed area and then reactive monitoring and active management. So, you know, this is an area where we could be doing more in terms of locking down. Does everyone necessarily need to have full administrative access to the desktops in this area? That type of stuff. Um, you know, we, we can set better rules and priorities within our seam as to when things go wrong here. And of course, in the core, you've got in-depth defense and active monitoring. So you've got uh, a lot of alerting systems around this. You see some weird behavior on this. You act on it as quickly as possible. Um, and that's sort of the, the model that um, we're moving towards now. Um, so when I'm talking about the core, I'm talking about first users. So core users are folks who have direct access to things like the ERP. Um, so our, our total student information system, our enterprise resources, HR, IT, finance, um, administrative professionals, um, our, our university management. Those are core users. Thank you. Um, those are the folks we need to spend the most time um, educating, understanding stuff. We can't, if, if we can't afford a breach in those users. So, you know, th this is a combination of education, policy, um, the devices they use. So, and I, and I think um, Lawrence raised a really good point about focusing on BYOD, the devices that we buy for um, these kind of sensitive users. Yeah, these absolutely should be encrypted. They should absolutely have um, the ability to remotely wipe um, all these different defenses we can use. You know, for one of our, our senior management group, I'm actually um, proposing that we have a laptop loan program when you travel overseas where we have a secure, clean machine they can check out. Um, and then when it comes back in, that thing gets flushed and filled. Um, so thinking about the devices they use to access data. Then, of course, is the network uh, that they use. But that's also things like VPN, the tools they use to securely access it from their device and gather their data. You know, are we as secure as we think we are? What are, what are our best practices? And then, of course, the servers at the end of the day where the actual data is stored. And this presumes a model that's actually locally stored data, and we're not getting into the whole cloud discussion. Um, that's just a whole other uh, thing to get into. So that's kind of the, the IT security chain at the core level. One thing I do want to go back on, um, actually, the size of these circles in my mind is, is determined. You can have more areas considered core and protected relative to the resources you're willing to put into protecting them. And so if you've got one person or nobody on your campus specifically assigned to security, your, your core, what you're actually able to really protect is very small. 
And so there's there's a relationship, inverse relationship between resourcing and how much you're able to protect. And I think that's going to be a really important um, lesson for senior administration across higher ed in Canada to think about is um, taking that risk management approach, assessing what they really want to protect and what resources they're prepared to invest in doing that. So one of the things that we're actually learning from our, from our approach when it comes to this Justice League um, type thing is that you can split up incident response um, and have different um, folks with different expertise leading it. So on, on one hand, you've got an investigative team. Um, so they're looking for data losses. What types of data was lost? How did they get in? How did the vulnerability happen? Um, do forensics as required? And you can have a team lead for that um, and, and, and really get that information going. At the same time, working parallel with them, you can have a remediation team. Um, so they're looking at restoring core functionality, particularly in, in, if, in, in a major incident. Um, and of course, they're looking on taking the lessons from the investigative team and applying it to, uh, to make sure there's no further vulnerabilities. And then finally, this is one um, that came really in handy with our, with our email incident. Um, was a communications team, and, and they're not just a communications team. We have a really awesome manager of communications for IT, but she's also a client advocate, and she kind of reminds me every now and then, well, actually more than now and then, but she sits around the table to very specifically going, think about the impact to the user. Not to negate what I'm saying from a security perspective, but simply think about how we need to explain this, think about why we need to change this, think about what impact this is going to have. And it's not to say at the end of the day that that means we don't do stuff. It just means we think about what we're doing and, and having that voice around the table. And communicating early, accurately, and often with security incidents is really important. Um, and that's a lesson I've learned from communication. And it's a lesson I, I know from a reporter is that you can establish trust and credibility by being as honest and transparent as is possible. And it's OK to say, we just discovered this. It affects this right now. We will provide more information later. Um, never lie, never make stuff up, um, provide the information you have, but be consistent about how and when you're going to provide your next information. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that is our Justice League approach to IT security. I'd be happy to take questions or actually ask for, for uh, thoughts on your school's model. Yeah. Um, beginning, just uh, mentioned uh, changing people's behavior. I wondered what you're doing and how you're, how you're going to, say, to get their attention. Awesome. I'm really glad you, you asked that question. First, I always shout out to Cuccio and Jeff um, and all the work that happened there to get the IT security awareness course up and, and running. And, and, and we have it in our desire to learn. So it's a, uh, a self-paced course. We've had, again, like 500 some folks through it, 150 actually complete the whole thing. We set it up so they could actually just check out the modules they were most interested in. So that's one area of it. We have this cool Are You Safe campaign with posters all across campus that direct people back to our IT website um, where we've got some additional information. And we've been sharing on our IT blogs um, cool material we come across in the web, whether it's SANS or whoever, you know, videos, tips and tricks, et cetera. Um, I've given presentations, not well attended, it was a voluntary presentation for resident students because I was trying to go right to the source of one of my biggest problems because I, I also get the joy of dealing with all the copyright complaints um, that come in from downloaded material. So I'm trying to say not only are you got this massive headache um, in terms of copyright stuff, but you're actually infecting your computer and you could lose your term paper um, if you get something really nasty on there. So um, in the fall, um, or actually, yeah, I mean, in the fall, I'm going to do some more road shows on campus. And actually, um, one of the things I learned from AUCTC last week when I did a presentation that basically was kind of our case files of everything we've dealt with um, was we should talk about this more internally. We should tell our stories within our community because people relate to stories. And uh, you know, someone else here I just met at the conference, her, her name's eluding me, and, and she mentioned she also uses a storytelling method as well. And, uh, and I just realized as a reporter, it just makes perfect sense. We intuitively actually can make more sense of things when it's told in a narrative way. Um, and it means more than me saying, oh, we need to have better coding standards to avoid SQL injection. And say, well, this is the story of happened and this was the impact that happened to us. So that's that's part of the awareness. The, 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 I went to... Um, 
geez, what conference was that? It was in Atlantic Security Conference in Halifax, which has been going for a couple of years. And they brought in this company that actually does these behavior change videos for the Coast Guard. And some of them were absolutely hilarious. They were culturally sensitive to that context. So there were swear words that I can't repeat here. Um, but it was hilarious, but it got the point across. And the basic theme of that video was an employee was getting terminated. Um, and they talked about, hey, Bob, I know you didn't mean anything by having your kids uh, photos on your USB drive. And you just want to show everybody but that USB drive, you didn't know that Johnny in your household had downloaded a whole bunch of MP3s from Russia, but they weren't MP3s. You load them in, and now we've had a major data, bre data breach. You something to us, Bob. And uh, it was really effective. Um, but their whole thing is about uh, behavior change, actually making logical connections so that people aren't just aware. They actually stop doing what they're doing. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Well, that's just it. Like, it's, it, it, we are on the maturity spectrum. We're we're still we're very young. Um, I, I I really like the multi-team approach because I'm not a CS background, um, so I'm not capable of going in and fixing some of this stuff. I, I bring a lot of whys to the equation, which um, comes really in handy actually. Why did this happen? Who did it? You know, how do we fix it? That type of stuff. Um, and I don't bring any history with me, so I don't have any biases one way or the other. Um, for us, the big things are, um, to be honest, this summer is our opportunity to get out of the 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 pwnage game on low low intensity stuff that keeps getting us. So having our mail server exposed, SMTP server exposed in the world, that was that was just a bad idea. And so it's now behind the firewall as a result of an incident. Um, because of another incident where that high powered Linux server got abused and turned on a cloud provider for the US government, um, we're getting rid of remote access directly into devices on our campus, excluding some research devices um, via just straight SSH and RDP. You have to use a VPN tool. So that's an easy one that we're, we're moving towards. And actually one that I'm really excited on our web server side is our primary web server is going to be enterprise CMS only. So www.yumi.ca is coming from a secure CMS where the only code and script is written by our central IT team. And then we have a secondary server, www2, that's sandboxed off. And it actually doesn't have, by policy, any sensitive data on it. Those are the easy stuff that gets us out of the game. And then we want to, um, the big thing that our quality assurance persons talk to me about is having a security strategy and building more of the policy and frameworks, doing things like updating our acceptable use policy around mobile devices. Um, and one other suggestion that was absolutely brilliant was updating that uh, that policy on, if you do have an exchange environment with ActiveSync, you can get these devices remotely wiped. We currently have it set up, so our policy is we won't wipe anybody's device. Um, we'll tell them, you know, they've got to deal with the privacy office and all that, and we'll show them how to use the tool, but we won't do it centrally. Um, that's just where we stand now. Yes? Sure. Yep. Yep. And that's and that's pretty much where we've been at is on the operational side. But um, we're still waiting for the the third role to we're going to evolve and who's going to actually fill that next. Um, it'll be someone with a network perspective, I think. Um, but so. You know, our, our systems folks, in terms of their priorities going forward strategically, is establishing better standards and best practices, particularly for code developed within our central IT department, um, and then gradually closing down vulnerabilities that have been known for years. Um, so it's kind of cool, though, the way that the way that our approach works is that um, actually it happened ten minutes for the presentation. I noticed that there's a an IP in France that was really active um, with a particular device. So I was able to call Ben, the other current um, team lead, and said, Ben, can you um, help out with this? And, and he can actually go and assign resources within his team. I can also directly approach um, you know, a systems analyst or, or a, a manager, uh, not a manager, but a, um, a system in on a particular system and actually ask them to help an investigation. So it's very matrixy, I guess is the best way to put it, um, in terms of, of how the, the roles work. Yeah, I mean, it, 
essentially the way it works is that I have the formal role for it. I'm in the terms of reference for the security action team developed by the AVP. Ultimately, I answer to my director and the AVP. Um, but within my terms of reference, I have access to the resources and um, I have the freedom to maneuver um, to get issues dealt with, which is. No, no, the, 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 ben, ben, has the, ben has the exact same. So when I'm not available or around, Ben can do the exact same thing. Um, I use I a lot, but it's just my thing. Um, just got a comment. You, your first type there, the um, the girlfriend's having her account stolen by the boyfriend. Yeah. What we've done at our place is we just bounce those right over to our protection services because it's potentially illegal. Yep. And for us to protect, they're good at keeping the logs, making sure the evidence is chain of custody, you know, all that yep. kind of stuff. And we just act as support for them. So yeah, in, 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 in essence with that, we, we do involve our, our campus security folks as well, but we're the ones who have got to gather the logs and the information. Um, so one thing I didn't mention is that the team approach extends beyond IT. So um, when we had a, a breach of a third party vendor for ticketing, um, it wasn't an IT system on our end, um, but it did actually involve our risk management office and our privacy office. And there was a really awesome presentation, I think it was Queens, who've really got a great model as well, working with those different offices. Um, and security is absolutely part of that larger larger team. Um, but they're not, they're not IT, um, so they're gonna look at us sometimes and say, okay, what does this actually mean? What devices were accessed? But in the case of the, the uh, cyber stalking one, that was already a police file. So that that's why it went straight to the police. Any other comments, suggestions? Are we insane? You've got a question over there. Oh. <laughs> Do IT security teams actually need team members who possess superpowers? Um, <laughs> maybe the Jedi mind trick. Um, it's not really a traditional superhero power, but I'd love to be able to say, yes, we need the new firewall. Um, but no, uh, yeah, so. Uh, I, but I, actually, I do think will. Will is a huge, uh, the, the, the willingness to actually follow through an issue right from the start to the end and fight some of the crazy political battles that we've got to do to, to do it. But this also goes back to picking your battles, which may be you know, a superpower of really good judgment. Um, you know, one of the things that's hard is, as I've learned this job is that some of the stuff is really scary and you've got to explain that out, but you also have to look at what the actual risk potential is not only just what the the actual damage is, the likelihood as well as the damages, and and learning to balance that, um, and learning to to go to sleep at night and not worry about the network. Anybody else comments? Uh, does your team uh, work on remediation and uh, foresight? 